Committee of Stevens Point Board of Park Commissioners Meeting, recorded February 5, 2020. It's time to begin. Uh, roll call, please. Freckman? Here. Gladowski? Here. Hall? Here. Kirsch? Here. McDonald? Here. Volkanik? Here. Shabilsky? Here. David Shorter's not here. Uh, Slinsky? Here. Sorensen? Here. Zerzua? Here. Okay. Uh, item number two, approval of the minutes of the uh, 2nd of uh, January meeting. I move approval. I second. Second. Okay, any discussion, corrections? All right, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, motion passed. Okay, next is presentation discussion on the Emerson Park concept plan. And uh, Mike, are you the uh, yes. designated person? Thank you, I'm Michael O'Mara, 1809 Clark Street, Stevens Point, Wisconsin. We're uh, asked to be on this uh, agenda and talking to you so that you know what we're thinking. The Friends of Emerson Park is a grassroots organization of people who live uh, adjacent to and near the park. It's uh, uh, young families and old retirees like me, and uh, people with children and people who have grandchildren, and some that have neither. Uh, when we uh, became energized as a uh, committee, Friends of Emerson Park, when we uh, lobbied to have the Emerson School site be turned over to the city to become a city park, uh, we were aware that in the park plan, uh, our area of the city was the area that was identified as uh, being underserved and not having a city park within walking distance of a great number of people who lived in that area. Well, we were successful with that and Emerson is now a park and we're very happy about that. And now it comes to what are you going to do to uh, spruce it up? We have uh, the, the turf on the park is in fairly disastrous condition. The uh, playground uh, does not meet any of the standards for safety for playground equipment. And the basketball court, which is used uh, day and night, uh, is in woeful uh, poor repair. Uh, so the Friends of Emerson said, well, why don't we see what we could do to uh, Prove it. So to that end, uh, we have been uh, uh, working. We've been uh, applying for uh, grants, and uh, we've uh, done some fundraisers. We do have a, a Friends of Emerson uh, account with the Community <coughs> Foundation, and we have a minuscule amount of money in there. But uh, we intend to start, and so uh, we uh, talked to Rettler Associates and. Uh, they uh, offered to uh, put together a concept plan for us at no cost. And that's what we're showing to you this evening. Uh, this is not anything that we're asking for right now, but we wanted people to be aware of what, what sort of things we were thinking of. When we uh, uh, had discussions uh, with the uh, committee, uh, what they, what, the, what they said they wanted was they wanted to have a open space where children could play ball or soccer or where they could play. They wanted a uh, updated uh, playground area and they wanted to uh, maintain the basketball court because that's, that's probably the most used facility we have. And uh, so uh, then uh, the, uh, some students from the university, one class took and looked at it and did a few renderings and that then uh, Rettler has uh, done these renderings for us. And uh, now I'll leave it to the rep representative from uh, Rettler to uh, further explain 
uh, what's going on. Um, thanks, Mike. So Rettler is not actually with us tonight. I'm going to kind of give an overview of, of where things are at this point. So what's before you tonight really is uh, a feedback period is what the Friends of Emerson are looking for. They want to engage the public is what their next step is. But prior to doing that, they wanted to talk to the park commissioners and see if there was elements of the plan that they've been working on for uh, quite some time and getting feedback from within their committee and, and their, some of their constituents around the park uh, before they take it to a public input to see really what the next stages are, um, other elements. So what you see before you right now is the rendering that really came out of the four renderings that Mike had mentioned through the, the class that they worked with. Um, there was a couple stage process to it. Essentially, you know, if you remember the current site plan, the playground is tight to uh, the main, basically main road there that where all the heavy traffic uses there on the north side. In addition to that, there's no access. So park standards have changed significantly over the years in terms of when we upgrade structures, having to have uh, ADA accessibility to them from day one. So I think the first thing you probably notice when you look down at this plan is that there's a significant improvement to access throughout the park. So as you look, the playground was, was moved to the southern, southern east or southwestern corner with the idea that it's more peaceful when you're over there. You don't have as many vehicles that are tight to the play space. So when parents and families and uh, friends are there watching and using that space, they're able to look at or sit on the benches and they're not necessarily right tight to the loudest <coughs> part of the park. Um, in addition to, you'll see that there's a proposed shelter space that's in the middle. The number escapes me here from where I'm sitting, number nine. Mm -hmm. And how that's depicted here is there's some flexibility with the space. The idea is that could be something great, as, as essentially as much as flush toilets with a shade canopy, or it could be something as simple as an open shade canopy. And the, the friends group is working through that process. To the west of it, you'll notice that the basketball court, like Mike had mentioned, uh, they, were no, they were very sensitive to the idea that that had been there, and they wanted to update that and, and maintain it. You'll see it's actually multi-use is how it's depicted. So if you look, you'll see a basketball court on both the northern and southern edge and a tennis slash pickleball court in the center of it. The idea is that it's not necessarily a competition basketball court. You're not going to have a lit area that you have basketballs being dribbled at midnight or people playing competition games. However, it's, it's a, a space that can be used for multiple uses so that any given period of time, depending upon who's in the park and what their interest level is, they can use it. To the south of that, to kind of build off another area that's used for multiple, uh, multiple uses, number 11, you see kind of the dark asphalt area that connects between the sidewalk and that multi-use court. That's an asphalt area that could be used for art, maybe chalk art. Um, they haven't really dialed in exactly because they want to be able to work with potential partners in the community to, to identify what that art could look like. As you go further south, I talked about the access sidewalks there's actually a border that goes around the entire playground to, for two reasons. One, again, it allows anybody with mobility impairments that accessibility to go all the way around and transverse the playground, as well as it delineates exactly where the playground edge ends. So you don't have uh, the certified wood fibers expanding out into other portions of the park. So from a maintenance standpoint, we're actually able to swing our mowers right over top of the concrete and blow the grass out. So it can aid us as we work through our playground as well as where the park edge is. It doesn't make your play space grow, which you'll see in a lot of places if we don't have a berm or we don't have a delineated edge, you know, you'll see wood fibers start to expand out. You'll see that the two, the couple of the mature trees are still in the plan. They're, the group wanted to be very sensitive to maintain the greenery and the treescape that's within the park, as well as you'll see some of the new trees that are planned uh, within that park as well. If you look towards East Street on the west, one of the issues that we've had since we've acquired the property is that we have a trouble plowing the snow on the sidewalk with our equipment. Right now, the sidewalk is very tight <coughs> to the actual street edge, and cars park pretty close <coughs> to it. As the snow builds up, it's really hard to delineate, so you'll actually have cars park into almost the sidewalk. So we've had to be very careful, and in some instances we haven't even been able to go through there with our maintenance equipment because of where that sidewalk is placed. So this plan actually calls for creating a boulevard there where the sidewalk would be slid to the east, potentially have a tree bank there if, if we can fit it in working with Todd, that would be the plan, and then we would have that easier snow access. Probably more uh, importantly and visually, you see the dotted edge that kind of goes around the park's edge. That is not a fence. By moving and relocating some of the things within the park, the idea is actually to remove the fence and have a complete sight line through the park, similar to a lot of the other parks that we have. And it also would allow then basically you to access the park from all angles if you don't need a hardscape. However, there is the clear kind of delineated lines with the sidewalk to go in if you do have a wheelchair or things of that nature. As you look to the east side of the park, we do put an ice rink in the park. So the figure eight outline that you see shows that we still would have the capability, if we would choose for the long haul, to put the single track ice, track it, uh, ice rink in. 
or to make an ice rink, you know, if we want a big square one there, that's there as well. But we wanted to maintain the Friends of Emerson as they were looking through. They wanted to have that multi-use green space area that uh, from things simple as throwing a Frisbee to potentially maybe playing catch to having baseball in that bottom corner with the backstop that still is maintained. Really that space it can be improved so it's better grass but used for a lot of different uses. That's really the, the major highlights. The other things that you'll notice is in the top northwestern corner, the, the Friends group wanted to maintain the planting bed and really the um, flagpole and things that are already there. Potentially that would be a location for a new park sign based on some of the final plans from this board's feedback as well as the community input side of it. And then really the rest of the park, uh, the idea is to try to maintain or in, improve <clears throat> some of the green space that right now we don't have some of the best grass growth that's there. Uh, that's really the, the high level. A couple other uh, intricacies, if you look in, there is bike racks. So there's a, a spot where people can put bikes. There's benches, which we don't necessarily have in a lot of other locations that do look right in at the playground. And then also, if you look um, in terms of the, to the right or east of the shelter, there's actually beanbag or cornhole boards that are concrete so that if people bring the bags and they can actually use that structure in the park. A few of these things may not end up exactly where they're located. It's going to depend upon some of the feedback and as they start to dial in more on it. But as you can see, it's a pretty good framework of kind of the layout. To take this a step further before, I guess, comments come up, the Rettler, again, has been a tremendous partner of the Friends of Emerson Park, and uh, they've been working hard and closely together with this. They've actually provided a visual rendering that I'm going to quick just play for everybody to see here as you go through. I promise it worked in the pre-setup uh, here. <laughs> Structures in the playground, things of that nature, are not specific. That those are all things that would be designed later. Uh, this rendering is more so to let you get a feel for what the multi-use facility court would be, those boundaries for the play space, the benches, the bike rack, uh, some of the potential planting areas, some of the lighting that's in the park as well, some of the ambient lighting that could help navigate through after hours, as well as the existing you know planter area and stuff that's up in this corner of the park that we talked about maintaining. This gives it a little bit more feel than it does on just on paper. I'd say. Is there room to have a pickleball game going on while somebody's playing basketball? Or? It'd be pretty tight. <laughs> there would be room, but if people want to shoot threes, they'd be almost right on top of the game. Okay. You can see the lines don't necessarily yeah. intersect there, but. What's the figure eight? Address. That would be the single track of the ice if we wanted to do it in the winter. Oh, okay. We just wanted to pick it. Right now, and Scott can speak to this, he'll speak to it later, probably, I'm assuming. There's a, there's a portion that we put in every year that's kind of figure eight. So I'll oh, just okay. play this again. It's a minute and a half long. So if you want to reference it here again as we go through. So, Mike or Cindy, if there's anything I missed, feel free to go ahead and jump in. But that's really the gist of the plan thus far. Um, I've been attending their, their meetings since I uh, joined the staff here in the city, and we've been talking through kind of the process or what would be going forward. And again, they came tonight looking for some feedback from the commission, uh, so they had that with so they can take that forward as they do their public input process. The hope would be after leaving this meeting, the input process could go on, go forward from there, and then the final plan would come back to this commission for approval, and eventually ultimately approval by the city council as well, uh, following that process. So with that, I think if there's questions, feedback, or questions for the group, um, we, we'd welcome them. Yeah, are, are there any rough estimates on, on cost of this? And is there any money available to 
the, the rough from estimates, the city budgets? The costs haven't necessarily been dialed in yet as they're working through the plan. The city put the 60000 towards this project for really the playground aspect of it, park improvements. So that's the seed money, essentially. They do have a fund at, the uh, I think, the community foundations who host it right now. Um, and they've began, I don't want to speak for the group, you guys can definitely weigh in, but they began to talk about once this would get approved, some of their fundraising <coughs> mechanisms that they'd look to partner on with hopefully local organizations, uh, individuals, people, um, and partners here within the city and around the surrounding area. Thank you. Cindy Nabel, District 3. Um, one of the other things just to make sure that people understand is that we don't want this just to be a park like any other park. Um, Cash Park is an amazing park. We have one. We have parks that look similar everywhere. This is going to be in the middle of our city that people cross through in and out. We want to make it to have some reference towards environmental <coughs> and maybe to our city as a logging company or whatever, you know, so that the whatever we do put in for equipment and things is going to be have a definite purpose to it. And we've also been speaking with Create who has asked if they could be involved in doing some type of art artistic <coughs> something um, that we could put in there that would be um, something that people would come to, maybe like the paintings we have downtown <coughs> where people go and take pictures of themselves, something that makes it stand out, something to show that this is a showpiece right here in the middle of our town, that we're lucky enough to have this green space for our city neighborhoods that have small lots to have this space. And um, one of the biggest things we heard way, way back long ago was the importance of having some open space. Mm -hmm. And um, that is true. It's, a, it's for kids to be able to go play soccer or fly kites or whatever they want to do. They'd have a whole area to go into still, whatever age. But I think Create is um, also another great partner. And we are lucky with Rattlers came <coughs> to us and said, we, we want to help you do this. So. And Dan has been fantastic. So it's taken a lot of years to get this as a, owned by the city again to be able to do something. But I think it'll do a lot for all of our neighborhoods in the inner part of the city. I, I take it that uh, the uh, plan is more for spontaneous use. We're not talking about any kind of schedule activity, baseball no. time, or anything. It's just the kids in the neighborhood come <coughs> by, get a few of them together. They yep. want to toss a softball around or yep it's use definitely a court or not going to be a oh there's going to be a set team that yep. comes and plays it's it's definitely going to be just for general play yep. so i was just going to say as a former teacher who taught at emerson school i'm just thrilled to see uh, and mm -hmm. read uh, all the things that that you're planning to do and your committees worked on i think it's great mm -hmm. thank you I guess, as a follow-up to the question about you know being at more of an open space, would there be and Dan probably a question for you an opportunity with that pickleball court to actually use that for because pickleball is a growing sport and fits a certain age demographic. Could that court actually serve as a location for potential pickleball leagues that might be an enhancement to the community? Yeah, I know that uh, there's some informal pickleball leagues that already happen, like at Gerkey, and they mm -hmm. use other locations. So yes, if if say a, an organ or group said we want to do some organized games here, they could. Mm -hmm. okay. Essentially, they just wouldn't have the ability to reserve it without us talking about that in our office first. Sure. Okay. And then I guess a follow-up to that, I, again, I, my kids spend a lot of time at that park. We live about five blocks from here, so it's kind of cool to see uh, what they're looking at. <coughs> I'm also encouraged, we spend a lot of time at that ice rink in the, in the wintertime, so I'm glad that's really the only local community ice rink in that neighborhood area, so I'm glad to hear that's a plan. Um, but is there a potential knowing how tight that street is, especially in the south side with all those rentals? Is parking going to potentially be an issue around that park? Based on what we've seen, they, there was no talk of adding par or, uh, parking within the park. Okay. Street parking was the only aspect that was going to be improved, mm -hmm. essentially. Okay. So um, it, it, could it be looked at? It could. It would impede on some of the, the green space, likely, okay. if that was a consideration. Yeah, they just don't really have a lot of space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to make this a regional. Okay. It, it, it's not competing with uh, Ukolt or Kirky. It is, it is meant to be a neighborhood park. Mm -hmm. And that's what its purpose and need was in your comprehensive park plan, is neighborhood park, and that's what it is. Yeah. 
I, I guess I raise the question only because I go down Ellis Street quite a bit. And even if, you know, a neighborhood like, you know, eight blocks with a couple little kids is a drivable activity. So, you know, I just want to, I raise the question. I hope it's a problem. I hope that we get so much use that, that parking is an issue. But I wasn't sure if there had been any conversations about what that impact might be with those improvements uh, to, to the potential to get close to that park with a car. Yeah, and I can make a note of it. I think it's something we can definitely discuss. So if mm -hmm. it's a fair question, that would be the time to, to vet that. Okay. Especially now that students are parking back further because mm -hmm. there's kiosks over by mm -hmm. where I live. Mm -hmm. So now they're parking all over there. So I think that was like a great question. And you bring up a fair point that even if there was, you know, say 10 stalls, 20 stalls, whatever it would be, when this would be completed, you're going to have such in the initial because it's new mm -hmm. uh, you're definitely gonna have people visiting it and right. then it'll take time before that new factor wears off right. as well <coughs> yes uh, this might seem a little bit uh, too detail oriented but I'd like to request that we make sure that there are sufficient bike racks because I think there's so many places we go in the community and there are not enough like down in the square when you go down to farmers market if you're on your bike <coughs> There really aren't <coughs> enough places to park the bike, so if we could um, try to be sure to uh, cover sufficient bike parking. The other thing, uh, again, maybe a little bit too detail-oriented, but I know that you have a number of planting areas um, <coughs> indicated on here, and I'm wondering if we can't go for uh, native planting, you know, prairie plants, that kind of thing that's going to be attractive to the insects and uh, speak to the community. Good. And do you have, you haven't talked about any uh, fundraising activities yet, or are you looking at that? Yes, we are. You are? We on that, okay. we had to get, we wanted to get your input first before we started looking at that, and then we have to have the, the community input so mm -hmm. that we start and have a plan and concept to give to people so we can start getting there. Is there going to be some kind of recognition for donors? I know yes. quite a few of the places have had that as yeah. part of it, so, and, okay. And there have been a couple of grants already that people are working on for Great. this too. So there's a lot of, that's going to be hopefully driven mostly by public <coughs> donations. Thank you. Yeah. Right. So would this shelter be something people could rent for events? Based on our current model at being a neighborhood park, no unless we were to change that route down the road. But right now, it's not proposed that way. Yeah. Carol Malepsky, 2125 Clark Street. I'm just down the street from the park. I'm not a member of the group that's beginning to plan this. But the only reason I happen to know about this meeting was because my nephew mentioned it to me that it was on the Planning Commission tonight, and I don't routinely look at what's on the agenda and as I was looking at the houses that are directly around the block my feeling is that if we're here if you're here as the Commission as the Planning Commission um, similar to the fact that when my neighbor decided to push a garage back close to my my uh, fence I was notified because it was against the back of my, my property. But it seems to me that even though it's about a public park and it is an improvement in the neighborhood, I counted, I think there's 19 properties around that square of the Emer Emerson building. I think they should be here tonight. And I don't know if anybody who lives on that square is here tonight because they don't know about it. And I think that if you live across the street from this, you ought to know and you ought to be in, in it when it comes to a public kind of meeting like this that is the Planning Commission. I think those people should at least have been given the courtesy of a note next to their, their mailbox or something or calling one of the neighbors and saying, could you put this notice that there is in fact a meeting tonight regarding what's going to happen across the street from you? I think that as far as transparency for city government, even though this is a good thing that's being put together, I still think that the people that live surrounding that area, you're already talking about parking, Ellis Street is very narrow, um, and 
the majority of people, if they happen to drive, will probably be in that park area. But um, I think that those people should know about the meeting that's happening tonight. Because if my nephew didn't mention to me, I would not have been happy. I want to know what's happening in my neighborhood. And for those people, and I don't live right on the park, and so don't notify me, but the people that are directly affected by it, if you're a city commission and you have a meeting regarding this, I think it's only proper that you notify them. So that's what I have to say. Thanks. Okay, any, any other discussion? <coughs> well, I guess I would just like to uh, provide input regarding the parking. Um, you know, as it was just stated that, you know, hopefully we have a problem with parking. I, I, I would just hope that we kind of have that in the back of our minds when we're planning this, you know, that if we do have, you know, a lot of vehicle traffic coming to this park that we have a plan, you know, and what we're going to do, how we're going to, you know, she had a good point that if I live next door and all of a sudden, you know, we have these cars parked all over around, which, I mean, it's a good thing, but... Again, I'd like to see that we're at least thinking of that as we move forward as planning this, of, you know, maybe even taking a portion of that and having a little parking area within the park. I guess that's just my input. How many cars are over there now, now with the ice skating rink? There. It, I, I can, it, it varies. I mean, it can depend. I mean, is it a problem now? you get complaints i have not at our office we've not received the complaints but i would have to check with the police department to see if they've ever gotten calls or alders would be able to answer that probably better as well if they've ever received call i think we have to keep in mind too that this is a small area mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. if you start putting in parking for a half a dozen cars or so there isn't much left mm -hmm. that you could do with that so that uh, i think again the, the concept is one of spontaneous neighborhood use rather than in scheduled or formal mm -hmm. events. Yeah. Anyway, this is not an action item no. tonight. Yeah. This is a, a, simply a for information. Go ahead, Liz. You, yeah. oh, I just have one more question. Um, this is going to be fairly <coughs> expensive, I'm sure, and I'm sure you'll get a good response from the community and from folks in the neighborhood. But have you looked at um, how it might be developed in stages? Are you looking at that in terms of if yes. it's not, too expensive to do all at once, like prioritizing it the? It's definitely too expensive to be done at once. <coughs> mm -hmm. can, can you go up to? Oh, certainly. This project is definitely too expensive to be done at once. Yeah. But unless you do a layout of the whole thing, you would, could end up spending money that would preclude you from ever completing the park. Sure. You know, you don't want to put in something that you're going to tear out. Mm -hmm. And so you see this. Uh, this is years away, but you have to do it ahead of time and decide where stuff would sort of go mm -hmm. so that you uh, are in a position to phase it. And we were confident that we would be phasing this. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, I think we get worried about parking. I mean, this is a neighborhood park. I, I live over in the Parkwood area, you know, and I've been over there a lot. And, you know, I see a few cars and those things scattered around during the day. I don't envision parking being a problem. I would think most people would walk, um, yeah. especially in the summertime. Um, but I think this is a great idea. There's definitely a void in that neighborhood for green space. And, you know, we used to have <clears throat> a lot of green space when I was growing up. A lot of these schools had green space and basketball courts outside. Not, nowadays, it seems like some of those have been absorbed by parking lots and expanded buildings, and, and there just isn't in some of these older neighborhoods. And I think this is an important thing to get going on. I also appreciate you mentioning that because um, I did have the phi ed teacher from Jefferson School contacted me and she said as much as how much they've lost 
to pavement and parking and even though they got the road you know closed off now they do have a nice space when she takes her students over there for track they still go over there they use the school a lot so they are really really excited about this being kept open like it is but also having that whole perimeter area too so they they do use it a lot too and they walk over from school so I'm glad you mentioned that Tori Jennings. Yeah. And, okay, yes. Tori Jennings, 1632 Ellis Street. I'm also Alder for District 1. First of all, I want to compliment the Emerson Group for all the work in the Park Commission for, um, for your input on this um, and the sophistication of, of this kind of presentation. I'm really appreciating this. And my district also benefits from this, so I take personal interest in this project, and I want to compliment everyone. Um, regarding parking, this is, I'm just echoing what people have said. This is a neighborhood park, and the point is for people to walk to it. We're trying to increase physical activity, biking and walking, so uh, we're very familiar with induced demand. So if you create parking, you are creating a reason for people to drive. Um, there's an argument for a case to be made for uh, why a extra parking spaces should not have been put in at Mead Park because it's just encouraging people to drive there instead of walk and, and bike and get their kids and families out exercising. I mean, that's, that's the point. So uh, I just hope this doesn't devolve into a, another we need parking spaces uh, discussion because we keep trying to pull ourselves away from that and understand what induced demand causes. And so um, let's stick with this being a neighborhood park and people walk and bike there and be part of a community. Thank you. Well, okay, I think we've probably come to the end of the time we want to allot for this and this issue will come back uh, later. Okay, for item number four, special event. Yeah, thank you. Thank guys you. For coming. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Okay, item number four, special event request, uh, paddle quest, and matric. Uh, yes. How do you want me? Do you want me up at the podium or to sit here? <laughs> Go up. Okay, so typically um, for special <coughs> events, new special events, uh, they come before the Park Commission when they're in the park and we go over them and uh, seek approval or request approval. We just happen to have yeah. Matt here tonight, so just rather than me happen. sum it up, I thought we'd just have Matt kind of go over it. Sure. So. Okay, Matt Kirsch, 1001 4th Avenue. This is very official. I didn't uh, expect this, but this is going to be great. Um, so I don't know how many of you know what Paddle Quest is, but uh, I started it in 2002 as a film project after college and it was a mockumentary type event um, and it's evolved through the years it's grown uh, from three teams in the first year to about 72 75 teams now um, it's part garbage cleanup it's part adventure race there's uh, characters dressed up in costume at checkpoints all along the river so the teams start and they paddle out with their team to different places along the river collecting garbage, collecting uh, points and treasure and stuff like that. They bring it back to what used to be Lakeside Bar. The Lakeside Bar was the home for 10 years. Uh, great, great home, but uh, the Buca Park offers, uh, it's not a bar for one thing. So it's a little bit more family friendly. That, you know, it's, just a, it's a more neutral starting place. Uh, Lakeside Bar is still gonna be the camp party at Lakeside Bar. Not at Buca Park, which the idea got thrown around, but um, Bugal Park is just going to be the launching point. Um, we will be setting up on Friday, uh, the launch on Saturday, 10 a.m. Uh, how the logistics of that are going to happen will, are still up in the air, but it's a lot of boats. Um, hopefully, we can use the boathouse as like a shuttle uh, to shuttle the boats through to the beach, uh, and that presents a little bit of a problem too because there's that barrier wall and all the boats and all the rocks and getting all of that is gonna be take a little bit of uh, work. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited to have it at Bugle Park. Um, we did host a paddle quest once at Torpy Park in Manaqua, and that was pretty cool. Like, to have that more public 
it's more public. You know, there's people around walking around. What's going on? It's exciting. There's there's a lot of boats. It's an exciting start. You got 70 teams, so you got about I don't know 150 boats in the water all at once, heading out on the river. It's pretty neat. So uh, having it at Bugle, I think, would be great. Um, any any questions about it? I, I move we accept this, approve this request. Okay, is there a second, okay. Chairman? All right. Any okay. further discussion? Are there any other events that weekend? So we've got this blocked out in the calendar. There's nothing that conflicts in Buchholz. Um, and just some housekeeping items in case you're curious, being that the event does charge a fee and it's uh, there's uh, they're using Buchholz Lodge, there would be a rental fee that we've talked to Matt about. He's aware of it for the lodge itself for the days they're using it. Dino's, as you're aware, Nature Treks uses that um, beach house building or boat house building. So we're going to work through that process. And if it works out, great. If not, we'll work with Matt to find a location that'll work for him. So that's kind of the housekeeping pieces of it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so all in favor of the motion to approve, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion passes. Okay, uh, item number five is uh, the awarding the emerald ash borer treatment. Uh, so bids have, have been put out and uh, they've been opened. Correct. So our quotes uh, were due on Friday, and they were open. We received two of them, one from First Choice Tree Service, the other from True Green. This quote was for 2020 and 2021. The previous agreement was for the two years pri or previous to this. True Green did have that contract. Uh, the bids came in at, for First Choice Tree Service, $6.28 per diameter inch. True Green was $6.15. Uh, Todd did put this little memo together stating that uh, both companies have, have served us in the past and there's no issues. So based on that, we are recommending award to the low quote. Uh, True Green for in the amount of $6.15 per diameter inch. We treat approximately 3,400 inches and we do budget this expense. So this is anticipated. We do have it in our budget. Okay, so we need a motion then to, to accept uh, the recommendation to take for the Except for True Green's uh, bid, so somebody want to make the motion soon. I accept. I move that we accept True Green's motion. Okay, I'll, I'll second. second. Liz, any discussion? Just a question. Do we know why the cost went down? I mean, that just seems unusual. Um, I, yeah. <laughs> so the uh, the product they use, I think, is I don't know if it's necessarily becoming more av available, or they're just getting more um, more larger quantities of it. There was no exact explanation why, but yeah, we did, if you notice the 2018, 2019, it was 650 per diameter inch. Yeah. So. Could be competition too. Yeah, it could be, mm -hmm. no doubt, no doubt. They were pretty close as you see too. You can see we're getting some pretty competitive bids. And if, it's not to get too far into it, but we do about 325 trees annually, 750 total over those two years uh, with this treatment. Certainly cheaper than taking down the tree. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. All those in favor, <coughs> signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, motion passes. Item number seven. Uh, six, the, uh, six, 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 excuse me. The um, dealing with the problem of... Uh, of um, Supposed rentals with um, a cancellation that we're not aware of. So we have a couple things going on that trigger this. The primary reason that this is before the commission tonight is that we are going to an online reservation and registration system. So in the operational budget for 2020, we plan to have a system in which you'll be able to actually go online and view the calendars, see what's available and what's not available. In addition to that changeover, in which typically if there's no fee, it becomes very complicated when you're booking or not booking on the website. Um, we've had numerous, just in the time that I've been here, also speaking with the administrative assistant who just retired with us um, over the last fall, people come to us kind of expecting to pay, and then we tell them, oh, you don't have to put anything down for a single day reservation. They just give a phone number. And we do have it happen where <coughs> people are planning things a year in advance. For example, maybe it's a wedding or maybe it's a graduation party. They book it because they don't want to lose it. There's no money exchanged. Then they might find something. <coughs> so much time is between it. Um, they may fail to call it in or 
p potentially maybe it's answered in a different office in our in our or different somebody answers the phone that's not in the front <coughs> office it's not recorded so we have uh, every month multiple rentals that don't come get keys essentially we miss out on the revenue uh, that also doesn't allow people to rent those facilities so the model was very uh, lenient and, and it was it was nice for people there's definitely convenience to be able to just rent it and not put the money down the only thing we collected a deposit for was a multi-day rental it was a hundred dollar non non-refundable everything else there was no cost so it didn't matter if you didn't show up or not what this does is gives it a little bit more structure it really follows everything that we've done may 1st you can begin booking for the following calendar year that's the same thing we've done for a long time the fee structure doesn't change but it does put in a refund policy it makes the money uh, be put down on the facilities if you're doing it You'll notice there still is a provision because we do have multiple reoccurring users. We have some that might rent the gym, for example, 30 times a year, rather than them having to put a big check down where dates change and we'll have to do multiple refunds. This will allow us still to invoice them quarterly, things of that nature. So we do have some flexibility built in with this, but uh, this will allow them people as they reserve online, the fee will be calculated right for them. And should they choose to need to change something at that point, we could issue a refund. And again, we've had people typically are thinking they have to pay for it. This is really the model for um, whether it's, you know, if you're renting something from Century or from another location in town, mm -hmm. these deposits up front to hold the facility is very, very common in a model. And it's very common for municipal governments as well for park and recs. We just had a pretty, again, lenient policy that's been very convenient, so. Okay. Yes, please. Um, Will the online system then accept credit cards? Is that how it's going to be set up? Yes, yes. Well, great. I didn't realize we were losing that many, and thank you for identifying this and taking care of it. <laughs> what is the vendor? For the, it's uh, Civic is who our website's through. Civic Rec is the software. And then we're just finalizing the credit card vendor that we're going to use, but Open Edge is likely the one that we're going to move forward with. <clears throat> cool. Dan, with a 30-day notice, is does that give you enough turnaround time to re-rent that facility? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, we could go to 60 days. That probably would give us more time. Um, it, it was really more of a, what's, I guess, the most fair, being it's a big mm -hmm. change. Um, realistically, in the middle of summer, we probably could probably still turn them around because people are looking for picnics. Mm -hmm. It depends upon the time of the year a little bit. Mm -hmm. Have you considered maybe doing a couple different dates with different fees? In terms of for the different locations, like or sixty days, either different locations or sixty days out, it's a smaller fee. If it's thirty days out, it's a bigger fee. We could definitely do that. Um, yeah, we could definitely consider that. We hadn't originally when we talked about it, um, but we just went with the thirty days to kind of as a starting point. But if mm -hmm. that's something the commission felt that that might be a better model, we could definitely consider that. Okay. I, I like that idea. Yeah, I think if, you know if somebody calls, you know, sixty days prior, that you know mm -hmm. there won't be in you know, on that way. It gives you a little more time to sure. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if they called 60 days in advance, they would be able to get, you know, the refund minus the fee. If they called 30 days, maybe get half of it back. Is mm -hmm. that what you're kind of saying? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So 60 days, it'd be full plus the processing fee. Right. 30 days or less, it would be, or I should say 30 days of notice, between 30 and 60, you get 50% of your fee back. And it's, that's fairly consistent with facility rentals. There's, yeah. It's usually a scale of sure. a refund. So something to look at. Very good, very good point. Good idea. I think if, too, if people can see on a calendar and see what's available, I think you're going to get more rentals mm -hmm. just because then it gives them more the agency to be able to check that out on their own. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the policy change that, that we will be voting on will be with this uh, revision. Correct. So it would be as, as printed except underneath the refund section we would put in the 60 okay. plus days notice you get a refund plus the processing fee. 30 to 60 day notice you get a 50% refund plus the processing fee. Less than 30 you can only change dates essentially or you don't get a refund. Yeah, I'd like to move we accept this. I think it's a great idea. Brings yeah. us into the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> it seems overdue. Yeah, it does. <laughs> okay, we need a second. I'll second. Okay, gentlemen. Okay, any further discussion? Uh, if not, all those in favor of the policy change signify by saying aye. 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 Hold the same sign. Okay. It approved and so the change can then go into effect all right I have item number seven this was an addition to the original agenda and this uh, is regarding the amendment to the uh, cell phone lease agreement in Kirby. yeah and I have to apologize this was amended we've added it into the agenda because it became through um, through our inspection department 
after we put it in the agenda on Monday, I learned of some more information that I'd actually like to take some more time to review before I recommend this for approval. Um, th th there's a little bit more to the changeover than I uh, anticipated in, in the documents we have. So I would just request if the commission is agreeable that no action be taken tonight. I'll bring back some more details and I actually hope to have a rep here as well for that meeting next month that they can make it with some more notice. And then I would, we'll have the approval for you for uh, March if that's okay with everyone. Okay. I think can I we, just make a yes. comment? Um, this is the teacher coming at, <laughs> out of me, but because the PJs is there and the Boys and Girls Club is right next door to us, uh, and the cell towers had this, it said they, according to what people have told me, the safety guidelines have not been updated since 1996, and that um, from the FCC, and and that the cell towers could um, or have been proven to create some um, problems with. Uh, um, for especially younger children, like they would go to PJs, which is middle school and and the and um, boys and girls club, and they just suggested that um, um, there's no frequency of what's being used or safety standards, and, and and it was very impressive all the things that were you all gave us. They're like the pages and pages of things, and I read through all of them, but I just think that. Um, that that as you're going through the things is just what safety um, things are issues when you're putting up a cell tower uh, in the Gurky Park where a lot of people use and, and especially PJ Jacobs kids are there like all the time and so are Boys and Girls Club which is right next door to it Okay, and a further discussion, otherwise this is not an action item tonight, so we will move on to the uh, presentation on uh, the winter sports area and winter outdoor recreation presented by Scott Halverson. Thank you. I'm Scott Halverson, I am your park superintendent. I'm here to give you an update on what we've been doing this winter. Our crews have been very busy and a winter we are having. Some, some years we don't have enough snow and cold weather to even open, but the last few, few years have been uh, very faithful. Thank you. Try not to move the house. So I'm just going to start talking, and if people have questions, just fire away. I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, Stevens Point Parks. Department Winter Sports Area. I got it. All right, great. This is Iverson Park. Um, Iverson Park got an early start this year. Um, our goal is always to be open for the Christmas holiday break. And this year it snowed in early December, so we were able to open December 13th, which was a Friday. And we were open that weekend and the following weekend. And we um, basically hauled in a lot of snow. We haul in about 150 cubic yards for making the toboggan runs and about 300 cubic yards for the rest of the hills. We oftentimes use a snow blower to push the snow where we need to or blow it where it needs to go, building up snow banks. We use the snow to minimize hazards, bury parking posts, steer um, sleds away from trees, that kind of thing. In the middle of that slide you can see the woods that would eventually be hit if we did not build up a ramp and that all requires quite a bit of snow. So. This was um, a tally of what, what our daily um, in, in uh, daily deposits were and <clears throat> it shows basically how much hot chocolate and how many rentals of toboggans we've had and so really you can't really see it because it's really small but the thing of interest is is the estimated attendance that I highlighted in red and we've got days that are not in the tens of visitors but in the hundreds there are some that this weekend was really big estimated um, 800 to 1,000 visitors. So um, it's, it's really inexpensive entertainment, 
people come and they use it. That is a shot of one of our toboggan runs. We have two of those. <clears throat> um, we're open to the public on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And then on Monday through Thursday, the facility can be rented for private parties. So the public is not invited for that. There's a, a question slash comment on the <laughs> toboggan slides. Uh, I lived here, I grew up here pretty much, uh, well, my whole life. Um, I didn't know about those slides until I was probably in my 30s. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I think it'd be cool to get uh, some promotions on it. I mean, yeah, there's no age limit. I thought I, I, <laughs> I saw the Please. video last year. Mike Weezer did a video, Back to the Future, the toboggan, uh, you know, Back to the Future. Yeah. Uh, I think it'd be cool to do more promotions on the slides, get, get the word out. It's super cool and unique, fun thing. Yeah, it's something that when people come to visit, family, what are we going to do? Let's go down to the park. We'll show you the, the toboggan runs. Right. Um, January, we had four private rentals. And February, we're planning on having nine rentals. It's going to be a busy month, assuming that we still have a winter. Things can change. Um, ice rinks. We've got five ice rinks. This is an ice rink that's at Iverson. It gets um, moderate use. Um, people that, one, if they've got multiple family members that want to do something, one kid can skate and the other kid can uh, sled or toboggan. Oh, Dan, can you help me again? I think yeah. I must have, must have tweaked something. Thank you. How those sledding hills after this weekend? Well, they, they're holding up. We've got one, one sled hill that has got some dirt exposed, but for tomorrow's party, we're planning on supplementing. We've got different stockpiles of secret snow. That we use. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the snow that comes from um, the municipal parking lots and some other places that we, we collect it. Okay. We get a lot of help from the streets department. When they want to remove the snow from the municipal lots, they help us out and dump it down at Iverson, and we, we position it. Good, you're snow recyclers. That's yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, this is a, a shot of the rink at Gurky. We have two rinks there, a big skating rink and a hockey rink that has boards on it. And that is, <clears throat> uh, we have a skate guard or a tenant that opens up the Parker building. There's the Parker building in the background. Those hours are open uh, Monday <coughs> through Friday, 6 to 9. And then Saturday, 12 to 8, and Sunday, 12 to 5. But the lights are kept on a timer, and they, they turn off at 10 at night. So even though the facility, the warming facility might be closed, we just warn them that we're closing up, grab your shoes, they can uh, continue skating and use the, the rinks beyond the hours of the, the warming house. And those get used quite a bit. Those are probably heavily used rinks. Um, if you're driving through this this evening, you probably noticed four or five cars like I did. New this year was the skating rink down in the square. That posed a, a challenge for us because it's a little bit different the way we built it. Typically, we just pack the snow. If there's a six to uh, four to six inch base, we pack it down, flood it and the slush kind of holds everything together until we get in, into layers and it holds the snow. This was on concrete. It had a crown to it. So we weren't able to just pack the snow down. We made a perimeter with six inch PVC and um, a liner, like a, a feed liner. So it was white, reflective, and it worked out well. So the, the edges of the ice on that rink are uh, just over four, five inches. In the middle, it's uh, about three. But it's a, it's a more of a nostalgic type of rink. We get quite a few users during the day, evening, different types of events. I heard somebody got engaged on that rink, so <laughs> we're, I'm not going to say it. Polka's on ice coming. Oh soon. yes, that's coming up in 
uh, February, February 16th. There's a event that's polka band's going to be there. So hopefully the rinks will hold up. Anytime after Valentine's Day is a bonus. The sun gets warmer. Even though it's cold, there's something that the sun does that makes the ice just kind of bubble from underneath. We've got some equipment that we've used to prolong the season by shaving that. It's an old Zamboni blade that we hook up to a, uh, a tractor. And that's helped quite a bit, but eventually Mother Nature wins. This is Emerson Park. It's not as fancy as the uh, rendering of the future, but this was a picture that I took today. Behind us in, in this picture would be the large oval area, and then in front of us is the uh, lazy river type um, track. So it's got a slight decline, which is kind of very strange for, for skating, but you're not stuck just doing circles on a, an open area. That's it. So Great. we'll see what's left of the winter. And my last slide was maybe think spring, but those uh, people that have the rental rentals on uh, the, the month aren't going to be happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Scott for the winter sports area, winter rec area? Uh, yeah, well, and how often do you have a situation where you really have more people at one of these um, places than you than, than the facility can really accommodate easily? Um, that's a good question. We haven't. It hasn't been really discussed. Okay. Um, the supervisors that are there that report to me will often just say, "Hey, it's been very busy," or. Um, it hasn't been busy at all, depending on the, on the weather. But I think the biggest bottleneck that we have when it's very busy is that we don't have enough toboggans, and the lines are long for people to go down the mm -hmm. the chutes. It does happen, but it's not all that often. I'd just like to say thanks for the work that you and your staff do on these facilities. It's something that. As a community, we really use a lot, and I think we're really proud of it when we have uh, visitors come. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I can echo that. Uh, being here seven months, I can tell you that where I've been before, I've never seen ice rinks in the condition they are here. We're really fortunate. We held a region meeting here uh, probably a month ago, and we actually have a couple members of the crew here in the, in the audience, Steve and Ken are with us that are park technicians that work with Scott. Um, th those guys, the guys that work with them, Scott, you know, Todd, Kate, the rest of them, I mean, our whole crew, Really, I mean, we've, we should be proud of it. We've got people that when they came in from other parts of the, of the state, uh, they were just taking pictures like crazy of what we've got for equipment uh, and using these guys as, as resources when they were talking about how do you make it, how do you do it. The downtown rink is an example. I mean, that came on, I think, in like a matter of three weeks. It was an idea to uh, let's do this, and uh, they, they got creative on trying to pull that off. So I'll echo again. I feel fortunate to be part, working with these guys, and they've really done a good job here since I've seen, and sounds like for a great number of years, they've had this down to a science. So. Uh, great job, guys. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, the last uh, item before adjournment is the director's report. I've got a few things. We're in the busy time of preparing and getting ready here as we look forward to projects. Uh, we're reviewing specifications for a Zamboni uh, replacement at the Willard Arena. So it's been a, a couple of years here a new. We've got a lot of the replacements of the facility, and now there will be a new Zamboni that we intend to order. It will take several months to get here, but we'll have it for the fall. Staff is working on a rubber, re rubber flooring replacement uh, specifications as well for the lower level. That also should be done over the dry floor uh, time of the year, and that'll go in before the fall. Greg and Kate are working, working on putting a movie at the pool this summer, so they're uh, partnering with the YMCA is our hope. They do that, movies in the park. We're hoping to do this one in Gurky at the pool. So mm -hmm. more details will come on that once they finalize it. We just had the state review of the pool filter replacement. So as you recall, there's DE filters there now. We're going to the sand. That has been approved, and then we'll have bidding starting. It actually just went out in the newspaper. We should have that up and running for bidding process here for the next three weeks. On the park side, there's been seasonal job openings that have been posted. We're getting starting to try and get geared up here for the spring and summer. Our annual ball field scheduling meeting was held by Scott with our local athletic directors and uh, youth sports organizations. That was on January 29th. The snow and winter sports activities, as you just saw, are in full swing. So that's taking pretty much all of their time right now um, until our snow keeps hitting here this weekend. We'll see what we end up getting on Sunday. <laughs> on the forestry side, 
The trimming season's really in full swing here for the crew. We have had a couple equipment failures with our chipper truck and things that we've been working through. Um, that's kind of put us on a little bit of halt. They've had to, to do some other things other than trimming right now with marking trees and stuff until that equipment's back to full swing. But that's really what this time of the year in, uh, encompasses once they do have the equipment up and running. Multiple staff members are attending the Wisconsin Arborist Association, Association Conference uh, next week. And that'll be actually a couple members from Scott's crew I think are going to that as well. Um, Todd's working on the 2020 planting list, pretty well near finished with that, and uh, the GIS plotting of the street trees. We hope to have that layer actually up on the website if people want to look, you know, what trees where on the GIS map mm. here very soon. Uh, the crew will be attending a diggers hotline training in March with several members of the crew that are going on that. And then uh, we're starting to work on that reroute, uh, some of the trimming in Buchholz Park. So there is several trees that have fallen over in there. So we're trying to get that opened up now while it's still solid. And then that trail will kind of be something that goes on here probably in late spring or into the summer. The administrative side of things, um, our park technician position, uh, we do have a person selected for that and they will be joining us on the 17th. So we're just finalizing all of the kind of finalize with the paperwork part of it. And then we're working on, I, I mentioned this earlier, our Civic Rec online res reservation and registration software. We have kind of a coding meeting tomorrow. We're gonna to start doing some of the back end of it. And we hope to try to have that ready for May. That's our goal to have that up and running for right. this year. And that should be a really good addition here for um, people with smartphones and computers. Obviously that kind of runs most people's uh, planning, planning techniques. It's much more than coming into the office these days. So busy time of the year. Just, just a quick question on the pool, the filter. What, what is the schedule on that as far as doing that? So we've got a, the bid opening is on the 25th, I think is how we've got it set right now. A substantial completion, meaning that they'd be done with all of the repairs by May 15th and a completion by June 1st, because after they finish, they have to put water in it and start to run the system. Yeah. So we told them that there's a heavy liquidated damages if they aren't done for the first, so that we can be up and running. So we, we've been told verbally that multiple vendors should be interested in bidding it. That should help. Um, so, yeah, it'd be a tight turnaround. Thanks. Okay, a motion to adjourn would be appropriate. Second. All those in favor, <laughs> signify by saying aye. 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 video of this meeting is available for viewing on the city's website, stevenspoint.com slash videos.